What's up, everybody? My name is Demetri Kafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this episode of Hidden Forces is the director of the Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy at Yale University, Michael Brennis. Michael joins me for a discussion about the U.S. defense industrial base, the state of American military readiness, and the effect that great power competition and the expansion and scope of U.S. military involvement in active conflicts overseas would have on the nation's political stability. If you want to hear more conversations like this one, including some of the episodes mentioned during the podcast, you can find those by clicking on the related tab to this week's episode page on our website at hiddenforces.com. Io, or by selecting the geopolitics and IR category in the episode library. Hidden Forces is a listener-supported podcast. If you want access to our premium feed, as well as the transcripts, intelligence reports, or if you're interested in joining our genius community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events, and dinners, you can do that at hiddenforces.io slash subscribe. And with that, Please enjoy this excellent conversation on a very important topic with my guest, Michael Brennis. Michael Brennis, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you, Dimitri. Pleasure to be here. So, Michael, I uh, first discovered your work from reading an article in Foreign Affairs magazine titled How America Broke Its War Machine which was on a subject that interested me, and it's the primary subject of what today's conversation is going to be about. You're a lecturer in history at Yale University. Tell me a little bit more, and your interests, I think, lie in foreign policy, the intersection of foreign policy, political economy, and history. Tell us a little bit about what you do and what your primary interests are in this field. So my primary interests are the interaction between foreign policy and domestic politics. My work has centered around the idea that the United States and its foreign policy after 1945 is inherently bound up in how Americans think about their lives at home and their interactions with the economy of the United States military and how that economy then shapes their democracy. And so my first book for Might and Right was an examination of this idea that U.S. foreign policy during the Cold War created a defense industry or so-called military industrial complex that invariably brought jobs, brought prosperity to many Americans, not all Americans, of course, but many Americans. And that prosperity transformed how Americans think about politics and how they vote, how they think about who they're going to uh, support, both in terms of electoral politics, but also politically on the left and the right how they position themselves you know, in this milieu of the Cold War. And I think that, to me, tells us something to sort of echo in the present or move us into the present. That tells me something about how Americans feel about or think about. When I was writing my book, this is 2014, started as a dissertation, and that told us something about how Americans feel about the war on terror and how the war on terror shaped their lives, which was the genesis of of this book was my formative political years were during after 9-11. I got interested in politics after 9-11. I got interested in history after 9-11. And I was interested in how and why the Iraq war happened and how and why in many ways it, it became a quagmire. And I thought we could understand therefore the de democratic or lack of democratic checks on the Bush administration and the war descending mm -hmm. into a quagmire. And so this is so this idea of of the Cold War informing Americans' lives, both politically, economically, that hopefully I could tell me something about the war on terror. And I think therefore, after the war on terror, arguably in a post-war on terror environment, after 2021, after the withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan, it's going to tell us something my work hopefully speaks to something about how Americans think about China in a coming era of so-called great power competition. And my work therefore lies at the intersection of the present and the past between policy and history. And my work as director of the Grand Strategy Program is very much at that 
intersection of trying to think through ideas with students about how the past informs the present. So when you said that the war on terror was the genesis, so you said something was the genesis for this book. When you say this book, you're not talking about the book that you wrote on the Cold War. You're talking about your next book, which I think it's titled The Rivalry Peril, which is on the history of the war on terror, correct? Well, the, the, yeah, the, well, there's three, there three books. I, I was referencing my first book with For Might and Right, but then as I kind of think with but with all my work, you know, there's something to be said about how domestic politics, the war on terror echoes into the present, both in an era of great power competition than the war on terror itself, which is also another book I'm working on. So I actually love this because even though I had reached out to you about a month ago and we had scheduled this and this had to get rescheduled, my focus then was much more on the defense industrial base. But I feel like now because of the events that are transpiring in Israel mm. and the potential that this could become a larger regional conflict, I feel like there's an opportunity to also get into this angle. And I'm also currently reading a book. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's called Confronting Saddam. And it's about that whole period after the 9-11 attacks, which is also so interesting because now I'm at an age where increasingly the people that I'm interviewing, who I, you know, I'm reaching out to them because they seem thoughtful. They're either they're academics or policymakers with enough experience, et cetera, are now approximately my age. Mm -hmm. Well, this, is, this is like this fascinating thing, right? And I have the exact same experience that you had. This is when I became interested in politics. It informed my study as a college student. I lived at NYU downtown, right below Canal Street on 9-11. I was woken up by the wow. explosion, which moved my bed. And that informed my direction as a student after that. Hmm. So look, I, I think I was telling you this before we turn on the microphone that I feel like there are two parallel conversations that we could have here. One is on the defense industrial base, and another is on how protracted great power conflict, and maybe we can expand that to say protracted conflict in general, right. because now the kind of conflict that we find ourselves in the Middle East could certainly exacerbate great power competition, but there is an issue there in and of itself, and it brings us back again in such a weird way 20 years later back into the Middle East. We've tried so hard to get out. Mm. The Biden administration pulled out of Afghanistan early on in the administration. It was an important objective to try and make that policy pivot towards Asia, and time and again, we keep mm. getting sucked back in, and that's the concern now. So let, let's let start with American military readiness, and we can get into a conversation about the war on terror and everything else, but- sure. Let's just talk about this now because it's such a concern. You know, I think you said that you heard my episode with Elbridge Colby. Mm -hmm. Elbridge has been uh, more than anyone else banging this drum mm -hmm. as loud as he can that our industrial base is not prepared. Mm -hmm. In the intelligence report for listeners, there's a, a recent study that I have linked to as well as quotes that I have in the, in the IR of CSIS, which did a, a war game, which showed that within a week, certain critical munitions like long range missiles would be depleted in a war with Taiwan. The Ukraine conflict has stretched America's industrial base. I think you can cite some numbers for us, but something I think something like they use certain munitions they, they use up in one month what we can produce in a year. Correct. The Israelis depend on some similar systems. And now if we find ourselves in a situation where we have to support Israel in the Levant, that already stretched industrial supply chain and defense industrial base is going to be further stretched. So- Let's just start with this, which is how would you describe the state of U.S. military and readiness today for a protracted conflict or an expansion of the existing conflicts that we're currently facing? I think if you're talking about the United States, what's currently kind of in our lexicon in terms of policymakers talking about a war on two fronts or or two war the United States fighting two wars, one with China or one with Russia. That is obviously not a direct conflict with China or a direct conflict with Russia at the moment, hopefully never. But if the United States is supplying arms to Ukraine, and if the United States is then supplying arms to Israel in what looks like to be an escalating conflict at the time of this recording, that the United States is going to be stretched incredibly thin because we currently don't have the resources as the point it was in my foreign affairs piece, we don't have the resources that Ukraine wants and I would argue needs to repel Russian aggression. The Ukrainian, I think the numbers are the Ukrainians need about 1.5 million artillery shells a year, and we cannot supply that. The United States, uh, or the, should say the Biden administration, has now reached out to several countries and I think nine different companies to start escalating production of, of ammunition to Ukraine. 
with the expectation that those numbers will increase over the next year. But that is in the long term, right? And the war is obviously in the short term. And so in, that is in Ukraine. And I think we can't therefore count on the United States being the arsenal of democracy to Ukraine in the ways that would end the war in, in Ukraine anytime soon. And then if we're talking about Israel, I don't think the two, obviously, the two conflicts uh, or two belligerents are comparable. Israel has a GDP of about $500 billion. So it's going to take about that for Ukraine to reconstruct itself after the war is over. That's estimated. Those are World Bank figures, around $500 billion in, in Ukrainian reconstruction. But And so therefore, I mean, Israel's they're not better going, prepared. They're better they're, prepared. They're better prepared. Exactly. They're a more militarized society. Exactly. And we're not going to need that kind of aid to you, Israel. But I think that is also going to mean, well, if we're going to start sending more weapons to Israel in the form of long range missiles and other weapons, then you're talking about priorities, right? And any budget, well, budgets are reportedly, as Martin Luther King said, their budgets are moral documents, but they're also a reflection of priorities in terms of US foreign policy. And what you see now, I think, is going to happen, what it looks like on the horizon is that there's going to be a political fight in Congress over the will to fund both conflicts, the will to fund, particularly among the Republicans who are now looking at the Israeli or the Gaza war and Israeli Hamas conflict and saying, well, we shouldn't be funding Ukraine because we have to dedicate all our resources to Israel. I don't think obviously that's viable or true, but that's what's going to happen in, in a political context such as now. And this is sort of where I think we're we're headed. Certainly, as Janet Yellen and President Biden said last week, the United States can fund both wars given its budgetary priorities. But how much can that be sustained over a period of two to three, four years in the election cycle? It remains to be seen, I think. Well, there are people, again, like Al Bridge or Alex Velez Green, who was Josh Hawley's former NSA, who had been on this podcast as well. Mm-hmm. Those people have been making the case that the United States cannot continue to support Ukraine indefinitely or cannot even continue to prioritize Ukraine and also properly prepare Taiwan for the potential of invasion in order to deter a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. They've been making this case even before the opening of the front in Israel. Mm -hmm. So let's actually take a step back here and define some terms because this term military industrial base or defense industrial base is something that's become more common in the literature in the last, you know, year or so. You see it in more places. And yet, I think most of us use it and don't have a very clear idea of what it means. So my first question is, what does that term mean? What do those terms mean? And help us understand, give us a visual sense of what this industrial supply chain looks like. What does it mean? What does it look like when we talk about it a defense industrial base? So to answer your question, I think first the, the term defense industrial base was not commonly used until the 1970s. You know, that you can look at the historical record and there are very, you know, people are talking about defense industry or the military industry, but they're not talking about a defense, in defense industrial base. There are different terms for it. But it refers to, in, in sort of basic sense, the productive capacity of the United States in the United States in the early Cold War and up until the 60s and 70s to produce weapons for the United States military and its allies. And that, so just in general sense, it means the productive capacity, industrial capacity of the United States to produce weapons. What those weapons will be, of course, will be determined by the nature of the conflict, be determined by the demands of our allies and our willingness to supply the allies with those weapons. But that's just on one level. And so it was thought to be sort of an internal defense industrial base, like the United States, how much how much money can we allocate? How much can corporations do we have? There was an early Cold War up until, again, the 60s and 70s. There was a variety of different subcontractors in the United States, some big corporations like Boeing, Lockheed, and others. But there wasn't the consolidation of the industry, which we have now. And that's really when I think the defense industrial base starts to become much more of a of a term. And now when we talk about defense and the industrial base, as you imply, it's not just the productive capacity of American corporations based in the United States, but since the 1970s, there has been a credible amount of outsourcing of defense production to other countries and to other companies. And so you have basically the increase in arms sales in the 1970s, which has led to, again, supply chain issues. You've had subcontractors no longer finding profitability to you know no no no, long, no longer finding profits if if they're based in the United States so subcontractor is either closing or closing their their shop so to speak or the big defense contractor is merging with them 
And so now you have the outsourcing of the defense industrial base. And this has become increasingly a problem when we think about protracted conflicts like the Ukraine war, or potentially, again, what's happening in, in Israel. And that to me is, is, as you imply, that to me is a concern if indeed there were to be another war to break out, sort of amphibious invasion or some other kind of war to break out, because we wouldn't have the resources and more importantly, the time to deliver those resources to those conflicts in the time that I think our national security would want or our national security officials would want. Uh, and I think that is what we're talking about in terms of a defense industrial base, not just the productive capacity of the United States in the United States to produce weapons, but the supply chains, those subcontractors, and also the workers, which you haven't talked about too, who are you know both in the United States and abroad in many ways, right? they, their working conditions are different, but that's also something that's missing too, is the labor component of this, which if you also look at the numbers in terms of skilled labor, we are stretched thin. There, there aren't enough jobs, there aren't enough skilled laborers in the defense industrial base to produce the weapons that Ukraine wants, you know, that we don't have. And this is something that the defense contractors have tried to address by incentivizing or trying to get the Biden administration to incentivize education and other types of priorities to get more skilled workers into the defense industrial base so they can produce these weapons. So my question is, actually, it's two questions. I can combine them. What explains the current state of military readiness? And maybe that, another way of asking that is maybe you can provide more detail into what explains that. And then how have the incentives of military contractors and the broader industry that supports the US military changed in the years since the Cold War? So the current state of military readiness is your first question. I think the current state of military readiness as it pertains to the equipment and munitions and other supplies that the military needs in order to function. So I would say the the current state of military readiness is not it's not great. I mean, as, as you see with Ukraine, I think that was kind of the point of my piece in the foreign affairs was to say the United States military is not ready and to point to some history to, to show how much the United States at one point was ready and now it's not. And it was ready in World War II and in the early Cold War because of the way in which we financed defense production in the United States. Most defense plants were government, what called government-owned, government-operated plants. The government owned the plants, but they also owned, controlled the operations of those plants. That started to shift in the 1960s under Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense under Kennedy and then Lyndon Johnson, where you start to see the shift towards government-owned contractor operated plants, which left the contractors, the defense contractors, giving them much more leeway to deliver weapons in the ways that they wanted to deliver them and on time and how they wanted to produce them. So that's one element of this. So it, it what, took- was so the, Go ahead. Were those, were, were the, were those uh, companies engaged in foreign arms sales at that time? Like, How did that begin to factor in? That doesn't factor into the 1970s. Uh, so that's, that's another component of this is that you don't start to see significant arms sales abroad until the 1970s under the Nixon administration. And this is a response to Vietnam and the concern that the industry has that there was a drop in the defense budget in the 1970s, 1971. There's a concern that their profitability and also as they see it, the safety and security of the United States is going to be affected um, by their inability to secure contracts. And then also Nixon under his foreign policy says, well, we can't obviously get involved in another Asian war in his view, as he would put it, but we can still supply the munitions, still supply the arms to other countries to repel communism in countries where we feel if the, you know, obviously they do become communists, it'll be a threat to the United States. So here's a question. You know, First of all, every, many people are familiar with the phrase military industrial complex. Fewer, but still many are familiar with where it comes from, from Dwight Eisenhower's speech. And yet at that time, as you said, this was still largely a sort of public service, the defense industry. Yes. It sounds like also part of its evolution was going from a public service to a business. Yes. And a business seeks to find efficiencies and also to produce things that create more profits. Yes. Walk me through that process and how we've gone, where along the road did the defense industry become increasingly optimized for profit seeking? as opposed to actually preparing the United States for a war. And was the real inflection point for that after the end of the Cold War? 
I think actually it began during Korea because what you see were during the Korean War was much of the defense production during the Second World War was in the hands of the U.S. government. Like the U.S. government under Franklin Roosevelt created a series of wartime agencies that were based on the New Deal, based on federal agencies like the Work Progress Administration, that basically like the War Production Board, that was the WPB, was kind of modeled on the Works Progress Administration. Like these were government agencies overseen by people from private business who came into the Roosevelt government to help with the war effort. But this was, again, overseen by they're still government officials. It's still a government process. After the Second World War and during the Korean War, you start to see the defense production overall during the Korean War be much more in the hands of private industry. And because of this shift, and there's not, there are some of these kind of similar, you know, federal organizations created, but they're not overseeing the defense production process. They're trying to facilitate defense production to companies, trying to bring defense dollars into private hands, but it's not okay, we're going to give this contract to this company and we're going to make sure that this company delivers. And we're also going to make sure that the government hires people for this company and that kind of of regulation. It's more of, okay, we want to make sure that this community gets a defense contract so it can create employment and boost business in this part of the country. Let's do that. But then once we do that, the production of that, of those weapons, that material is in the hands of the company itself. And so it's not really a regulatory process that follows up on that. And that starts to escalate during the 1960s, where this is the kind of the norm by Vietnam. And this is where you get the military industrial complex quote coming from is the 50s and that that legacy shaping where Eisenhower Republican, um, you know, we call him a moderate Republican now, but Eisenhower Republican being concerned about the fact that there is very little democratic accountability for this industry because of the ways in which the government has allowed it to function in this way after World War II. And therefore, if there's no democratic accountability and this industry is profiting off various conflicts, and particularly the arms race, then it's beyond potentially, that's Eisenhower's fear, it's beyond democratic control in the future if it's not accountable to democratic processes in the present. So you've brought up World War II a number of times. Actually, let's Talk about that for a minute, because I think, and you also mentioned, I think in the beginning, are the arsenal of democracy. These are sort of ideas that people have in their heads that they reach for, I think, automatically whenever they think about the defense industrial base or American military readiness or what we need to do to ramp production, right? Mm -hmm. There's this idea. How far removed from that is, is that from the current reality? And also, how did America ramp up to fight World War II? And how long did it take them to repurpose U.S. factories from producing consumer goods to military goods? And is one of the key distinctions today the fact that the whole production chain has become so much more complicated and so much of what is produced today is so narrow and specific that you don't just have like, you know, a factory of Jeeps being produced by GM that gets repurposed to military vehicles? Yeah, no, I mean, you're alluding to something important, which is that during World War II, It was thought, so the war breaks out, of course, for the United States in December 7th, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor. But from 39 to 41, the war breaks out, obviously, in Europe, September 1st, 1939, with the invasion of Poland by Nazi Germany. And from much of 1941 up into December 41, the United States, under the Lend-Lease Act, is supplying Britain and France for a moment the weapons it's used to repel or it needs to repel fascism to repel Nazi Germany and the Axis powers. And it was thought that the United States really, it would take a long time to start shipbuilding process. I mean, building ships in 1941 is a complicated, it's a complicated process now, but it's very complicated. They thought maybe you could build like a ship in a month or something like that, maybe some, you know, two months. But what you start to see is the productive capacity of the United States under government auspices, under government control, being so much more efficient. And this is kind of one of the lessons that's lost, you know, I think in this era of like, well, the government can't do much, you know, private industry has is much more efficient. In fact, the Roosevelt administration was able to, because of the ways in which it said, no, we're going to do this this way and we're going to control how the production process is manifest itself, we're going to be involved in overseeing that. And so producing a ship, you know, in a month turned into like two ships and in, in two weeks kind of thing. And, and same thing with planes, you know, B, uh, B-51 bombers, like those types of things, they're actually produced in, in a pretty quick um, amount of time. And I think that's something to be 
take into account now, where that's not the purpose, I think, or the defense industry hasn't had to face that kind of conflict. We haven't had another, as much as there are allusions to it now, an arsenal of democracy, where there was an existential threat in the form of total war. And so private industry wasn't capable, I would argue, wasn't capable of meeting that threat alone. Neither was government. That's why you have this public-private interrelationship. And so that kind of, if we were really concerned about being an arsenal of democracy, that kind of meeting of public and private interests for the benefit of national security, for the benefit of protecting the American people should be what we're seeing now. And we're just not because of the ways in which the defense industry has been allowed to function in, in ways that I alluded to after the 1960s. But how much of that also is because the production process itself is more complicated? There are more parts. There were much fewer parts in the 1940s, late 30s and 40s in, in producing aircraft or cars. And those parts were produced in fewer places. Today, they're produced all over the world. And the resources, the commodities that the, from which the parts are made, in some places, their entire supply chains are located in America's in adversarial countries. Correct. So, I mean, how much more complicated is that? And who in the sort of defense sector, in your view, is working on this problem and understands the complexity of it? I, you know, I, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. The production process is much more complicated because, again, of things that I already mentioned, outsourcing, the lack of labor in the United States to produce weapons. So it's being, you know, outsourcing production means outsourcing labor and the sophisticated nature of these weapons, right? The technological sort of prowess of these weapons, which is it's not the case that you have in, in, in World War II. They're just, they demand more parts and more sophisticated parts. And more, I should say also more potential bottlenecks. I want to reference a True. conversation I had with Simon Winchester on precision engineering back in 2018 or so, where we talked about, I think it was Boeing that had to stop the production of certain, or maybe it was Rolls-Royce that had to start the production of their engines because of one little part that yes. there was something wrong with it. And so you comparing these sophisticated jet engines to propeller planes, which is what we had in the 1940s and the war against the Nazis. So like, it's also that you've got, besides the fact that there are more parts, besides the fact that those parts are produced in more places, there are also critical pieces that can stop the entire production process. Yeah. And, and I, I would argue that was a mistake to begin with. Like the, if, Again, if you're talking about, I would say the the military industrial complex or the defense industry or the military industry, whatever you want to call it, serves a public good, a public need. And that is protecting the United States and protecting its people from national security threats. And so when you export that, when you export the production process and you make it, again, the nature of the weapons are more complicated, but when you rely upon, as you said, adversarial nations for that process, you're creating bottlenecks to use your term, but also you're preventing, therefore, the interests of US national security from fulfilling what it needs to. And I think that is to me where I kind of entered in, into the conversation with the foreign affairs piece is to sort of provide some history and say, we've made an, a series of egregious errors, I would argue, since the 1960s. We've now gotten us into this mess. It's not just the consolidation of the industry and the privatization of the industry since the 1990s. This is a slow moving threat to the defense industrial base going back to the end of World War II. And now we have to kind of walk things back. We have to think about new ways, innovative ways to, I would say, rein in the worst excesses of the industry, provide government accountability, but yet also incentivize production in ways that fulfill the interests of the United States and, I would argue, the Ukrainian people, given the nature of the threat in Ukraine. So we've talked a little bit now about the actual process of creating the things that we need to fight wars. What about the strategic planning and strategic frameworks that the military and the defense sector have in their heads about what is needed and how the end of the Cold War, because this has been something that I've talked about on the show quite a bit. I feel like the United States has in some sense been rudderless. I mean, it, it mm. after the end of the Cold War, Bush made that that famous, what was it? How many points of light speech? Thousand about points the new of world, light. Yep. Thousand yeah. points of light, the new world order. The United States invaded Iraq in 1991 and set a precedent for territorial integrity. We seem to be off to a good start. 10 years later, 9-11, war on terror, invasion of Iraq. The strategic focus becomes insurgencies, light footprint. We spend 20 years bogged down in the Middle East. 
finally finished between, you know, when we pulled out of Iraq and then eventually Afghanistan recently, trying to pivot to great power conflict. Mm -hmm. So, so many of the skill sets and so much of the focus now is not relevant. What's relevant now is more along the lines of what we were dealing with during the, the years of the Cold War. And now look at this. Another conflict opens up in the Middle East. We might end up having to be there. So how much is the issue also that we don't really have a, an overall whole of government understanding of what the mission is, what we need to achieve, and how to get the public support behind civilian leadership in order to achieve it? How much of it is that? I think it's a big part. And as much as you know, I think you're correct, your assessment of the strategic picture is correct, Despite George W. Bush and the Bush Doctrine being seen as a guiding strategy for U.S. foreign policy, unilateral intervention, preventive war, that being a shift in U.S. grand strategy, I don't think actually that was what was guiding the Bush administration in terms of its foreign policy. And it wasn't, in my view, a good strategy, but it just wasn't, it didn't manifest in, in any clear ways that were productive for US foreign policy interests. What was guiding its strategy in your view? I think ultimately what the United States was trying to do was trying to pursue a series of threats, one very amorphous threat, which is terrorism, right? That they were trying to pursue terrorists around the world. And that if you call a war on terror, war on terror, that means you, you're not declaring war on a nation or you're declaring war on peoples and you're declaring war on this amorphous sort of term, this entity that is terrorism. And so that allows you to do, I think under the Bush administration was, you know, I think if they're talking about preventive war, be selective in who they go after. I mean, Iraq obviously was one case, but they're trying to pursue nation building in Afghanistan, nation building in Iraq, trying to stamp out terrorists in parts of Africa as well and other parts of the Middle East. That's a strategy of everything everywhere all at once, you know, kind of thing. And that's not actually good for the United States and doesn't prioritize its interests. And I think to me, you know, to go back to your question about sort of the defense industrial base, I mean, what the, what the industry says, to, what their defense is, is that we just produce the weapons that the government wants us to produce. Like we, we, you know, the government expresses a need, they come to us with that need and we deliver on it. So if the government wants joint strike fighter program, like the F-35, we'll deliver, we'll compete, we'll participate in the market for that contract. But what the government does with it is not up to us. And the government has to ask for it in order for us to produce it, not the other way around, the way that Correct. is in the commercial industry, or where companies like Autoril, for example, because I want to mention this too, Chris Bros, the head of business development over at Autoril, was on the podcast before. I think he was also chief of staff for the Senate Armed Services Committee or for John McCain, and he had some role on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Companies like that take much more of that sort of commercial approach of this is, we're going to work on these certain technologies that we believe are going to be important. And then we're going to try to convince the government that they need them as part of that overall process. Correct. And so what the industry says is that we are, we are not involved in the strategy making and they're right mm -hmm. to a large extent, but that would also mean, well, to your point, if we're going to prioritize, and again, obviously you couldn't see Ukraine war coming in 1996 or 2001. That wasn't wouldn't be the focus. But if we're going to see that this is on the horizon, that this is happening now, we should prepare for, if you have a grand strategy that is clear-eyed and plans out in the next 10, 20 years, prepares for a type of conflict like this. And so to your point about the United States being rudderless, I think we just thought, well, we're in a unipolar era. The United States has unprecedented military power. It has no peer rival. China, as was thought in the 1990s, will just move towards liberalization, both in its political, it was already moving towards liberalization, obviously, in its economic in its economic structure. It'll move towards liberalization in its political structure. Same thing with Russia, right? These autocratic countries will just, it's the end of history. They'll just transform themselves. They'll learn to love capitalism. Exactly. Become wonderful liberal democracies. And that didn't happen. And so what do you do then? Well, you try to reverse course. And I think that is where we're at now. So we don't have this, I mean, it's in some ways, foreign policy is always reactive. We don't have the kind of 20, 30 year long-term thinking that I think we need. And so now- what the industry has done for the past 20, 30 years is produce very expensive, 
equipment planes like the F-35 that have led to cost overruns that have, it's now the F-35 is going to be a, in total by the time it's, of its productive life ends in 2050 or so, one cost $1 trillion and it's potentially not going to live up to its potential. And you have, again, the United States needing to supply Ukraine with basic artillery and it can't do that. You know, that to me is a reflection of, again, I would say my the priorities of the United States and and its budget. And we just, we have to correct them. Yeah. I mean, F-35 is another great example because I believe there was a part, a magnet that was produced in China and they had to halt production because they figured it out. That's how complex these supply chains are. Yes. But I sense I sense frustration on your part when you talked about the F-35 fighter. Why do you feel that this problem, and I don't mean the F-35, I just mean what we're talking about today. Why do you feel that this problem has not been solved already? What's holding things back and what needs to happen in, in order for it to be solved on a timeline that doesn't imperil the US? I mean, the F-35 has, has its own history, um, but it's often used as an uh, example for things I've already said, which is the lack of strategic thinking and the lack of foresight in the minds of policymakers. I mean, the F-35 was supposed to be everything all of, to my point about everything everywhere all at once. It was supposed to be this kind of everything everywhere all at once plane, which is still, it's a very technologically sophisticated plane. It has technologically sophisticated radar. It can make all these different, you know, turns and twists. And I mean, it's just this fantastic, impressive plane. And it was supposed to be used against potential war with, you know, another great power or to take out terrorists and terrorist cells, you know, wherever they existed because terrorism was going to be potentially a threat, but we didn't know how big a threat it would be. But again, to my point, I would say then what that becomes then is this massive investment where, you know, it's not just the United States, but other countries investing in, in F-35. And because of the things you said already, that the production process being so complex and intricate and- Political buy-in by politicians exactly. who have members of the electorate invested in the project, in different districts across the United States, making it more difficult to shut down or- Revital or revamp. And yes, exactly. And then that prevents those parochial politics prevent a, a shift in strategic thinking because, oh, we need this F-35. Now we have to have it. People are already invested in it, even though, again, it's not going to deliver. So we're now still spending money. We're going to spend money because Congress keeps, keeps authorizing more appropriations for the F-35 because, again, as you said, now it's depending on job. We're dependent on for jobs, we're dependent on all sorts of things. And it's not just jobs in the United States, but other countries as well. So that is also a big part of the story, again, to the privatization story and the ways the industry has been allowed to function since, again, I would say Korea, that have imperiled, I think, US security interests. So what specific policy steps need to be taken? Let's really, I really want to get detailed here and let's start with the lowest hanging fruit. What can be done right now to begin to reverse the problem and move us towards a long-term sustainable solution and where people like you and Elbridge Colby and Alex Velez Green and others who have been banging this drum feel that we need to be. I think differ from bridge in, in a couple of ways, but I think the first thing I would say is that we need to rein in the consolidation of the industry. Like the the fact that you have these big five, the big five defense contractors, right? Northrop Grumman, Schwab, mm-hmm. Lockheed, McDonnell Douglas, North- Boeing, mm-hmm. and Raytheon. And those big five are ultimately in a position where they can dictate to the Congress when they can deliver and the American people when they can deliver on weapons. And then also the consolidation that they represent, that is the buying out of subcontractors and the buying out of competitors and just buying them out and just shutting their their business down because it's not profitable. That just can't be good for the United States and good for its national security interests. And there have been some efforts on this. I'm pleased by the fact that they're bipartisan. Chuck Grassley and Elizabeth Warren don't agree on much, but they do agree on the need to rein in cost overruns and consolidation in the industry, and they've sponsored legislation on that front. Right. What is that legislation that uh, I think Elizabeth Warren put it forward, right? She put it forward, and then I forget the exact title of the legislation now. It eludes, eludes me, but she sponsored uh, legislation with other Democratic senators, but then Grassley joined on other legislation in subsequent months. I think it was just last year, this year, sorry, they, they sponsored legislation. And it was a response to specific defense contractors who had, in their view, engaged in cost overruns and, and manipulated or, or had misled the American public on how much their particular mm. weapons would cost. And I think that, so that's just the, the immediate thing that can be done is sponsoring legislation like this. And this is the Biden administration is doing this. I don't want to say that they're just 
sitting on, you know, sitting on their hands, they're resting on their laurels and not doing anything. But again, trying to support or ramp up the production of ammunition. But then that has to accompany a deprioritization of, I think, these sort of technologically inventive ideas that don't seem to go much of anywhere. Like like the F-35 is one example, but the B-1 bombers, is like the B-21 bomber is another one. And I think that they have this promise of transforming warfare, but the history of, of them actually transforming warfare is these types of new weapons is not a very good one. So besides reversing those forces of monopoly and anti-competition, what can be done so they can obviously stop mergers, but what can they do or buyouts, but what can they do to incentivize the industry to be more competitive and to begin, for example, we have a munitions crisis in the sense that the United States doesn't have its stockpiles are being depleted. What can they do right now? Because that seems like another obvious one. What can they do right now to refill inventories in key munitions and weapon systems like HIMARS and Javelins and Stinger anti-aircraft missile systems that are being used and depleted in Ukraine that would presumably be used and needed in helping deter an invasion of Taiwan? I mean, I think the immediate thing would be for the government to incentivize subcontractors and subcontractors to get involved in this industry again when they've been either merged or, or priced out. And I mean, I use the example of a of a government owned contractor operated plant, which the Wall Street Journal reported on, uh, I think last year, that burned down. And it was making munitions, the type of munitions and, and ammunition that would go to Ukraine. It burned down a couple of years ago. And the industry just said, it's not profitable to make these munitions anymore, or ammunition, so we're not going to get involved. We're not going to do it. And the government didn't step in and said, well, like, this actually, there, there was an ammunition crisis during the Afghanistan war in, in 2001, 2002, in 2003. If you listen to, Iraq, to American soldiers fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, they were saying, we don't have basic equipment here. We don't have, we don't have vests. We don't have Kevlar. We don't have basic ammunition. So this is again a twenty-year problem. And then here you have this industry or this company that's making basic ammunition, and then it burns down. The government says, "Well, that's a contractor decision." So incentivizing that kind of small-scale production, and then allowing that company to thrive, I think would be something that again, because national security making, you know, it's a public service, the government should get involved in incentivizing that. And I think that the fact that this is happening, this is just one example, it's happening en masse, I think that but that requires government intervention of some kind. But who has to take the lead on something like that? Where does that come from? So first, I mean, that this is also key when we talk about the defense industry or the military industrial complex or again, military industry, often we're thinking, oh, President Biden has to do something, but it's Congress. Congress has to be involved. Can't the president issue an executive order to do it? They can, but then Congress has to fund it. And it's also executive orders, they're short term. Right? Or not politically stable, exactly. Correct. So they have to be long-term investments and Congress has to get involved. And as you alluded to already, the Congress of the United States, when it comes to the military industrial complex, it's invested in what's here already. I keep my jobs in my district for these purposes. And maybe, you know, they obviously see long-term op- for, to a certain extent in terms of what a defense contract down the road could do for their industry or do for their constituents and their communities. But there needs to be pressure on Congress to appropriate funds and Biden too, to appropriate funds for, for these kinds of purposes if we're going to see ramping up of basic weaponry in the short, not just short, but short, but long terms. So if I'm hearing you right, are you saying that it's primarily a political problem to get this issue resolved? Yes. A partisan problem? I would say beyond a partisan problem, it's a political problem. It's a problem of both parties. Yes. Republicans and Democrats, you know, both seek to benefit from the industry in Congress for the constituents. Is, for so the is that the issue? Is there gridlock in the legislation because everyone wants a piece of the pie as opposed to ideological differences between parties? Well, so it's the fact that that Congress hasn't thought of this problem until now, right? That there's, that, to your point, there's no long term long term thinking. And so now when we're talking about parochial politics, it's all about giving what we want for so I can get elected or reelected, right? And when you step outside of that election cycle, and when you step outside of these sort of parochial interests and you think, well, the United States must do more, we must invest in other things, that you need creative thinking, you need innovative thinking. And that's just not happening in Congress right now for things, reasons that you've said, the gridlock, but also in general, the fact that there's not sufficient political pressure put on Congress to do this at the moment, or President Biden. But again, things are, as I said already, are, are changing with the allocation of 
or with efforts to allocate or incentivize these nine companies in several countries to, to start producing uh, munitions for Ukraine. So you mentioned Senator Elizabeth Warren, Chuck Grassley. Is there anyone else in Congress that you feel really gets this issue and is trying to really push the ball forward? And I would add to that, less concerned about their own political status or what they can accomplish, but actually really focused on the problem. Like I don't know, if, for example, if John McCain would have been an example of that, mm -hmm. because also John McCain was also politically very astute and he you know, obviously he didn't get to be a senator for decades without having a sense of what was and what was not politically expedient. But who else is actually, you think, kind of that the public should be looking to as a strong spokesperson on this issue in Congress? I mean, you're hitting at something, which is that those who are in Congress or invested in this problem are few. And Grassley and Warren are the ones who have taken the lead on it. There are others. But I, I mean, in my view, so the, the situation is such that there's not at the moment a focus on defense consolidation because of the nature of the Ukraine war. We don't want to rein in the industry. Like the idea of reining in the industry or preventing it from doing what it's ostensibly supposed to be doing is politically bad. It's bad optics or could be seen as bad optics for some congressional officials. And I think Warren is just because she's her anti-monopolization has been her focus and Grassley too, to a certain extent, that she's allowed to kind of take up this issue and has taken up this issue in a variety of other, in a, in a variety of other issues related to monopolies. And that's how the, I think this has to be tackled is not just if we frame it a certain way as well, we have to rein in the industry at a time when the industry needs our help, then that's not good. But if we rein, mm. talk about reining in the industry as, as it relates to monopolies and allowing fair competition and fulfilling the interests of the United States and national security, that's a different political message. And I think you could start to frame it as that and get more people on board, more congressional officials on board if they were, were motivated to do so. So, Michael, before we uh, end our conversation today, I mentioned at the very beginning that you know this was sort of like a situation where there, I felt like there were two parallel conversations. One was on the, the industrial base and how to address this problem. And the other one was on the effect of great power competition or just military conflict or defense or national security threats in general and their effect on democracy. Mm. And then you also you know, briefly touched on the war on terror and how the 9-11 attacks informed your own career trajectory. Kind of put all that together for me. What is your concern in that area that's sort of informed your writing that we might be able to talk about to close our conversation today? Yeah, I think two things briefly. I think first, in terms of great power competition, my fear is that great power competition is going to be used as a term that can be seen to revitalize the United States domestically. That's how this is being framed. So if you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, if you look at some other legislation that the CHIPS Act, for instance, that the Biden administration has sponsored and Congress has signed, has put into law and Biden has signed, you see that China or great power competition is the justification in some ways for infrastructure, for rebuilding the United States. And as a historian, I think the track record of that is of foreign policy threats being used to rebuild the United States or restore American democracy is not a good one. And that when you start focusing on external threats, when you start to have to invoke communism or the Chinese Communist Party, yes, it might temporarily lead to some sort of rallying around the flag and support for some legislation. But in the long term, it creates, as we're starting to see already, a lot of xenophobia, a lot of nativism, and that's going to boomerang in ways that affect you know, Asian Americans and Chinese Americans specifically in the United States, as we're starting to see recently with the attacks on Chinese Americans or Asian Americans, a 300% increase over the past year in sort of anti-Asian uh, attacks, and also just a, a vitriolic, toxic rhetoric around mm. China that doesn't serve the interests of long-term strategic thinking. That if it's just, oh, China, 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 China threat, it creates this a lack of diversity and a lack of in terms of our thinking about how we think creatively about this threat. And if we just say we just have to focus on the China threat and direct everything towards it, then that becomes a very myopic strategy. Right. And totally. so we're not actually using the true powers of our democracy, that is the richness that we bring to free speech and free free expression, free debate about how we should behave as as a 
as a, the leading power in the world, we're actually just silencing critics or we're just focusing very narrowly on this particular issue and we're, we're not thinking about how all the threats are interrelated. So that's bad for democracy. And to me, that's also a reflection of the failure to learn the lessons from the war on terror, where we just said terrorism is a threat. We need to stamp out terrorism, and rightfully so. Again, the 9-11 attacks, you know, it was a horrible, uh, monstrous attack on the United States, and you know, we needed to respond to that threat. But what that led to was attacks on Muslims in the United States. We created Islamophobia in the United States. It heightened it. I would say created it, heightened it. And it also created, again, this foreign policy where we're just going to stamp out terrorists wherever they exist. And that's just not feasible. You can't do that. And that's also the, the sort of broader problem. Yeah. You know, what you left out there, though, is what I think was the biggest tragedy from the war on terror, which was the rise of the surveillance state. Yeah. And that has really been a defining effect or outcome from the war on terror that has remained with us. We built the Department of Homeland Security, the TSA, both new departments that came out of the war on terror. You know, People experience this in a very simple way of being molested on their way through airport security if they don't want to go into a giant body scanner that they don't even mm -hmm. understand what it, long term effects it has on them. And I had a guest on some years ago who talked about how when you're on the TSA line, because he was a former Soviet immigrant that came here during the Scoop Jackson legislation in the 1970s. And he said that you are in the Soviet Union when you're going through a TSA line. And my concern is, and I have said this on the show many times, and I continue to say to this day, that we are sleepwalking into a situation in this country because of our internal political divisions where we find ourselves in an international crisis. And now that, that may be kind of what's happening already. I mean, the war in Ukraine and whatever could end up unfolding here in the Middle East, and maybe we're already there. Mm -hmm. But we sleepwalk into a crisis where an international crisis where, and another example is a war in Taiwan. We lose an aircraft carrier. All of a sudden that happens and America with its internal political divisions finds itself in a place where it doesn't have the kind of democratic, pluralistic foundation in its day-to-day -day politics and conversation, because we also have all these siloed areas where people where conversations happen, to be able to actually respond to it in a way that's consistent also with our values. I think of another example. You remember this, 9-11. When 9-11 happened, the country immediately came together. I mean, I was living in New York at the time, and I remember... I remember I have this scene in my head of getting on the subway and the conductor sort of looking around saying, everybody okay? You guys all right? Everybody inside the car? That's not the experience of being a New Yorker. Being a New Yorker is they shut the door on yes. you and you have to like get past that. And I wonder today with the way that social media is, we all have this imagination in our head that at some point if the crisis is big enough, we're all going to come together. And I actually wonder if that's true and if in fact in today's world, the conspiracies would immediately start. The Israeli Jews clapping across the Hudson, the hologram planes that didn't actually crash into the buildings, all the various conspiracies that emerged after 9-11 that sort of had their own little ecosystem, but they didn't impact the larger conversation, would all of a sudden explode onto the scene and make it very difficult for people to come together. And that is my concern today, you know, man. I, I think that if a conflict breaks out, we're much more vulnerable than we were 20 years ago. I completely agree. I think it's already happening to the point about conspiracy theories where you're seeing mostly within right wing media that arguments that you know Biden's a Chinese agent or that his, his family's bought right. Off. He's in the pocket of in the pocket of the Chinese was Correct. one of these things that's been circulating. When in fact Biden has done much more, substantively speaking, to deter China and make the pivot toward Asia than the Trump administration did, which focused mainly on tariffs, which were evaded by going through third party countries in Asia and Mexico. Exactly, and so. That to me is is bad. <laughs> it's bad for the future of the United States, both its foreign policy and its domestic policy. When you have these types of ideas circulating out there, running rampant, and the rhetoric on China incentivizing it and escalating this type of rhetoric, because again, it's going to boomerang in some form, whether it's attacks on Asian Americans or it's going to boomerang in, in our electoral politics in many ways. So I, I just don't think that 
pursuing great power rivalry, you know, great power conflicts is that's something else, right? We're not in a great power conflict at the moment. We're in a great power competition or great power rivalry with China, but great power rivalry as a framework for understanding our, our moment is not going to be good for- For economic and political renewal, it's correct. not the right framework. So Michael, for people that want to learn more about you, that want to follow your work, that want to follow you, how do they do that? So I'm on Twitter or now X, <laughs> formerly Twitter at mbrennis1. I, that's sort of my major social media platform. I have a book for Might and Right, Cold War Defense Spending and the Remaking of American Democracy, that was published a couple of years ago, and I write regularly for Foreign Affairs and other publications, and you can check those out online. And I have an email address, of course, which is publicly searchable. So, Okay. Well, Michael, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you, Dimitri. It was a pleasure. If you want to listen in on the rest of today's conversation, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and join our premium feed. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, you can also do that through our subscriber page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. You can follow me on Twitter at Kofinas, and you can email me at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.